Hi everybody, welcome back to our professional development webinar series. Our goal in this series is to provide parish staff and volunteers as well as diocesan ministers the formation, the training, and the tools that they need to create vibrant Catholic parishes and growing ministries in the church today. In today's webinar, Stranger God, Encountering God and Refugees and Migrants, Sister Marilyn Lacey will talk about a very important ministry in the church today as well as a great need that the world has. So my name is Jerry Dees, I am the Digital Marketing Manager you're at Ave Maria Press, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Once again, this webinar is brought to you exclusively in partnership with the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership, the National Association for Lay Ministry, and the National Federation of Priest Councils. Everyone here is muted, but you can submit questions by text, writing them or typing them in the questions section of the GoToWebinar panel, which you can see displayed in your screen here. We'll take as many of these questions at the end of the presentation and offer them to, to our presenter at that time. Uh, you are also being, this webinar is also being recorded, so we can send a recording out to you later this week. Um, you will be able to see the slides, the presentation slides, if you are watching the recording. And if you're live, you'll be able to see us um, in the webcam. So with that, I want to extend a very warm welcome to Sister Marilyn Lacey. She is the founder and executive director of a nonprofit organization called Mercy with Beyond Borders, the mission of which is to partner with displaced women and children overseas in ways that help them move out of extreme poverty. She has worked with refugees for many years in Africa, Haiti, and Asia, and as the Director of Refugee Services in Cap with Catholic Charities um, in San Jose, California. Uh, she's the author of the very popular book here from, uh, at Ave Maria Press titled, This Flowing Toward Me. So Sister Marilyn, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Jared, and thanks everybody who's joining this uh, webinar. I'm uh, delighted to be able to share some reflections from my own life experience. Um, I've entitled this talk, Stranger God, and I've done that uh, intentionally. Let me just pull down some of the stuff on my screen here. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, a few notes on the title. First of all, from my experience I have the conviction that God is way stranger than our images of God. And secondly, that God is most likely to be encountered in strangers. Hence the title, Stranger God. That God, in fact, is a stranger and God is uh, so far beyond what we can ever imagine God to be. So those are the uh, the background convictions that I bring to this conversation and I want to explore both of them in a little bit of detail before going on to the meat of the presentation. First of all then, how is God stranger than our images of God? I really believe, uh, well it's certainly true for me and perhaps true for you, but I really believe all of our images of God are petty and small and insufficient because we cannot grasp the amazing presence and reality of this being we call God. First of all, God is the one who is always flowing into our lives. What do I mean by that? Uh, I think I can best illustrate it with a story. This is a true story from the life of Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, uh, who, as you know, wrote the famous children's book, The Little Prince, currently be made, being made into a movie, I hear. But besides being an author of books, he was a pilot. And he was a pilot in the 1920s when flying was still something very new and very risky. And he lived in France. He used to fly once a week from Paris over to northern Africa, to the French colonies, and deliver the mail. And it happened one time that he was lost in fog and he ran out of fuel over the Sahara Desert. He crashed and he would have died. He was injured but and he had no food and water with him so he would have died except for the fact that a tribe of Bedouin happened to be crossing by, saw his plane crash and came to his rescue. These people are famous for their hospitality. They brought in uh, Saint-Exupéry, they 
fed him, they nursed him, they healed him back to good health. And so he was so indebted to them, so grateful, that he tried to figure out how he could possibly thank the leaders of this Bedouin group. And then he hit upon an idea. Of course, this was the time of French colonialism. And uh, he thought, well, I will take them to Paris, and I will show them the wonders of French civilization. So he did. He brought a group of the leaders, the chieftains, to Paris, and he showed them the wonders of his city, the Eiffel Tower, which had recently been built, uh, the locomotives, the, the wide boulevards, the Champs-Élysées. And you know what? They really weren't impressed. So, OK, the next day he decides, I know what I'll do. I'll take them to the French Alps. And he does. And he takes them to a waterfall. This really got their attention. In fact, they were so stunned, absolutely speechless, by the extravagance of this waterfall that they couldn't even speak. They just stood there looking at it. I mean, think about it. They're from the desert, where you would walk for days just to come to a little oasis and get maybe a handful or two of sandy water. And here, pouring out of the mountain, is this extravagance of life, of water. And so they stood there in awe. And they didn't want to leave. And finally, it's getting toward dark. Saint-Exupéry says, well, you know, we have to go back to Paris. And they said, no, absolutely not. We refuse to leave until it stops. Now, this is a true story. And to me, it absolutely epitomizes the way God is toward us. This flowing of the water that never stops. I mean, San Exupéry had a very difficult time convincing the Bedouin that this waterfall had been flowing for, you know, 10,000 years, and it would probably flow for another 10,000. It was beyond their mental capacity to imagine such extravagance. To me, this is an image of God. No matter how expansive our idea of God is, it's not enough. God is beyond all imagining. And this God is always flowing into our lives, your life, and my life. Now there's a beautiful tradition uh, in the Islamic religion, a uh, uh, subgroup of, of the Muslims are called the Sufis. You're probably familiar with them. Their poetry from the 13th century has recently, the last 30 years, been translated into English. And so um, more and more people in the West are becoming familiar with it. It's a very deeply mystical, prayerful uh, tradition, which focuses on interior spirit of religion rather than exterior practice. And um, this poem by the, by the Sufi man named Rumi, written in the 1200s, I think is a beautiful prayer for us today. It starts out, for 60 years I have been forgetful, every minute, yet not for one second has this flowing toward me stopped or slowed. And the poem goes on. It is obviously about God's grace, God's goodness, God's mercy flowing into Rumi's life, into your life, into my life constantly, whether or not we are aware or thankful or grateful, anything. So that's the first point. Uh, and it, it's so important in my life that I, I used a line from that poem as the title for the book that I wrote about my learnings uh, how I learned about God through my interactions with refugees. The second point, a real conviction from my own lived experience, is that this God who is always flowing into our lives is always blessing us. That in fact, God cannot not bless. If you don't mind the double negative, God only blesses. Which means if God is truly flowing all the time into our life, that blessings are always uh, flowing into our life and accessible to us if we are awake and aware. 
I'll illustrate this with a story we're all familiar of uh, with from Genesis 28. It is the story of Jacob who colludes with his mother against his brother Esau. Now, Jacob's father, Isaac, is very old, he's blind, he's dying, and he wants to give his final blessing, very powerful, because in scripture we know that a word is what a word says, a word does, right? So he wants this blessing desperately, but the father wants to give it to Esau, to whom it is due. So the mother, Rebecca, and Jacob collude with each other to dress him up and to, uh, in the clothes of his brother and make him smell like his brother. And, you know, they go through all these machinations to obtain the blessing through deceit. And this is what happens. When Esau finds out, he is furious and he's going to kill his brother for this trickery. Well, Jacob finds out he has to leave town pretty fast. So he runs, and he runs as far as he can run until he's exhausted, he's in the middle of the desert, he, he grabs a rock for a pillow, and he lies down, and he falls fast asleep. Now here he, asks, here he is, a, a complete scoundrel, really. He's running for his life, he's a criminal, he's uh, exhausted, and he, he just falls into a deep sleep. And then what happens? The scripture tells us God drops a ladder right into his heart. Now that phrase, I, I love it very much, is taken from um, a beautiful little book by Barbara Brown Taylor called An Altar in the World. And he has this dream that up and down the ladder he sees angels, which is another word for messengers of God. So God's presence is coming in and out of his life in the most beautiful way, and he wakes up in the morning and he opens his eyes and he says, Whoa, God was in this place, and I, I did not know it. One of the most beautiful lines in all of Scripture. And I think, well, I often pray it when I first wake up in the morning, but I think it would be a wonderful prayer for all of us to say all day long, every day, God is right here with me in this place, and I, I'm sleepwalking. I'm not aware of God's magnificent, magnanimous, merciful presence. So, those who are awake, Jack Cornfield says, live in a constant state of amazement, a kind of joy, a kind of existential joy. No matter what's going on in your life, somehow God is with you, and somehow that presence brings abundant blessings unexpected blessings and a deep source of joy for us. So, in sum, God is stranger than our images of God and God is most likely uh, then to be, sorry, this is the second point, God is most likely to be encountered in strangers. Alright, let's explore that for a little bit. If you are familiar with the sacred scriptures, you will have to notice that from the first book of the Bible, Genesis, to the very last part of the Bible, the book of Revelation, there is a strong theme about God appearing in strangers. People don't recognize that it's God intruding in their life. And I could give you hundreds of examples, but I've just picked a couple because of our time limitation here. In Genesis chapter 18, we have that beautiful story of Abraham sitting in the heat of the day in front of his tent, and he sees three strangers walking by. Now, this is very barren territory. These are probably grubby, sweaty guys walking along. And what does Abraham do, this elder statesman? He jumps up, runs out, flags these guys down, bows down before them to the ground, Scripture says, and begs them, please, don't walk by. Come on in. Allow me to welcome you and offer you some hospitality. And so he does. It's a beautiful 
description, they stay with him for several days, and at the end, after they leave, it's apparent that they were messengers from God. They were angels of God, to use the terminology in Scripture. And they brought with them great news of an amazing blessing that Abraham and Sarah would have a child. So that's the very beginning of our scriptures. Moving on into the, the time of the kings and later the prophets, many, many stories of God's intervention in people's lives that went unrecognized. What about Elijah in uh, 1 Kings 17? Elijah and the widow. And remember, there's been a famine for seven years. The widow is starving. She's going out to gather sticks for herself and her son before she dies. And along comes this guy. She doesn't know it's a prophet. It's just a stranger. He accosts her and says, OK, wait a minute. I can see you're getting ready to prepare a meal. Give me something to eat first. Nice guy, huh? Starving woman and her son. And he wants a meal first. But the culture is so hospitable and also the, the place of women so uh, secondary that you have to do what a man asks. She prepares the food, feeds the prophet first, and then we know this stranger brings this immense blessing into her life that even though they're in the midst of this horrible famine, her jar of oil and her jug, uh, her bread will never, never run out. So a stranger again brings blessings. Then we have in the life of Jesus such a propensity for him to go out and be with strangers, um, invite them in to his communion, and sums it up, of course, in Matthew 28, the story of the Last Judgment, where we are promised that whatever we do for strangers, for the least among us, the most peripheral, we are doing for God. So at the very end of Scripture, we have again that uh, beautiful image that Jesus is standing at our door and knocking, waiting for us to open to this person whom we probably won't recognize. Maybe it's a homeless person. Maybe it's a, you know, your great uncle George that is an alcoholic and never gets invited anywhere because people don't feel comfortable with him. I mean, these are the folks, somehow, we don't know why, that God said, that's where I'm going to hang out. So precisely in our welcoming of strangers, we have a chance to encounter the living God. This has been uh, recognized for centuries and memorialized in art and literature. <clears throat> this is the famous Trinity icon by the Russian uh, iconist Rublev. It is, of course, a picture from the three angels who visited Abraham. So we have this in our tradition, but not so much in our American culture that by going out to strangers and welcoming them and offering hospitality, we will meet the living God. So if we do believe these two things, that our God is truly stranger than we imagine and is most likely to be encountered in strangers, then won't we live with a kind of holy expectation? We will want to be surprised by this inflowing of God. We will expect blessings around every corner. And, you know, like a child who's expecting Christmas to come tomorrow, it, that gives you a kind of uh, inner joy that cannot be quenched by external events. Here's another Sufi poem. I love it. And the poet is saying that I, I'm so expectant that God is the one who's going to be appearing in my life. He says, I hear a knock at my door. Well, who else could it be? So I rush without brushing my hair. What, what a marvelous image that is. We, on the other hand, always try to look our best before we present ourselves to God in prayer or going to church or whatever it's going to be. We want to get our life in order, make ourselves quote unquote presentable. But the mystics, they understood you don't have to be ready for God. God is already there. God isn't waiting until you're at your best. Look at Jacob. He was at his worst. 
when God dropped a ladder into his heart. And that's how God is. That will happen to you and me. Let me illustrate this holy expectation by a true story that happened to me a few years back in uh, 2010. My work currently is in South Sudan, which is uh, a rather extremely underdeveloped country and uh, currently at war again for the past two years and for about 35 of the past 40 years it's been at war. So it became a new country in uh, a few years ago and so I had a meeting in the capital city of Juba. I had never been to Juba and so I contacted my colleague in advance by email and said where should we meet? This is downtown, downtown market in Juba here you can see it's not a very organized place so he said we should meet in front of the Bedouin bar and hotel everybody knows where that is so my first time to the town that's where I go and this is what it looks like in front of the Bedouin bar and hotel I am standing there it's getting close to 5.30 or so, close to dusk. It gets dark at 6 or 6.30. I'm dressed uh, uh, in a light skirt and, and t-shirt, but I have a big straw hat on because it's extremely hot, really, really hot, and big sunglasses against the glare. It's about 105, 110 degrees. And the street is not paved in front of this bar. So every time a vehicle goes by, which granted is not very often, a motorcycle or a, or a car, it kicks up all this red dust. So now I'm, I'm very sweaty, I'm hot, and I'm sort of caked with red dust. And I'm getting annoyed as time goes by because my colleague does not show up. I learned later he had a flat tire, so in fact we never did get together. But after I'm standing there about 20 minutes, and it's getting dark, a blue van drove by very quickly. And uh, I, I could barely see the vehicle. It was just plumes of dust everywhere. But it got about 20 yards past me. And suddenly, the, it screeched on the brakes, kicked into reverse, and pulled up right next to me. Now, OK, I'm a nun, but I'm standing there in front of this bar which I think was also a brothel. And uh, the, this, it's dark. There's nobody else around. The driver of the vehicle rolls down his window, leans out, and I can see he's a big, burly African man. He leans out the window, and he points his finger out, and he says, you, I know you. And so I was getting a little bit nervous. I said, well, um, excuse me but where would we have met? And he said, in 1998. Now, that was 12 years prior to this incident. You were in Kakuma refugee camp. I saw you there. Your sister, Marilyn. Well, I, that was my name. And I had been in that refugee camp, but that's in another country. It's in Kenya. And I still didn't have any idea who he was, so, so I, I said, excuse me, but what is your name? And he said, I'm John. Well, that didn't help. So I'm racking my brain, and suddenly this, this uh, memory popped in, and I said, are you John Bulen Alir? And he jumped out of the car, and he said, this is a miracle. This is a miracle. And he grabbed me in a bear hug, swung me around, and he said, I have been looking for you for 12 years. Now, I still get chills when I think about this story because, uh, as you can see, the guy is now about six foot three, and there I am in my best sweaty self. Um, the reason I didn't recognize him is because when I had met him in that refugee camp 12 years earlier, he was a 12-year-old boy. Now he's a driver for the UN. And so I said, how in the world did you recognize me? Here it is. More than a decade later, I'm an old lady now. I, I had on sunglasses and a hat, and I'm in another country, and you're driving by at 40 miles an hour, and you recognize me? 
And he said, Sister, I've always been looking for you. I take UN people all over East Africa and wherever I go, Khartoum, Juba, Nairobi, Mombasa, I'm always looking for you. Now, I guess having been a 12-year-old boy, he was, he, I made an impression on him somehow. I don't know. We spent only one hour together in the camp, but I took an interest in him. I asked him who he was, how he became a refugee, where his parents were, what he wanted to do with his life. And before we parted, there were 82,000 people in that refugee camp. Before he parted from me, he asked if he could write his name in my little notebook. And so that's how I happened to remember it. That is not a story about me impressing him. It's a story about him living with holy expectation, expecting always to find a blessing around the next corner. And one day he did. I often pray, God, could I even live with a tenth of that kind of holy expectation to see where you are active in my life? OK, one more story about uh, recognizing God in strangers. This is a picture, as you can see, of the Dalai Lama putting a blessing cloth around my shoulders. This happened at an event in San Jose, California um, some years ago. Uh, I was part of a group of people who were being honored uh, for compassionate work. And that's not at all important. But what is important, I want to tell you something that happened the next day. OK, I wake up, I pray my meditation, I go to have breakfast, and I grab the San Jose Mercury News to read while I have breakfast. And there, on the front page, surprising to me, is this picture taken by one of their photojournalists uh, in an article about the event. Well, I was, I got to tell you, pretty excited. At the time, I was doing refugee work, and the Dalai Lama is probably the most famous refugee in the world. So um, having my picture there with him, it was, it was pretty exciting. And I thought, oh, my mom's going to love this, you know? So I'm thinking about that. and. Then I drive to, to work, to Catholic Charities, about a 20-minute drive. I stop to get gas at a regular gas station. Okay, I finish, and I drive off, and then I hear the noise that you never want to hear when you are driving out of a gas station. It's a metallic screeching noise, <laughs> like that. And to my horror, I realize I have forgotten to take the hose out of the gas tank. Because, of course, I was not paying attention. I was thinking about uh, you know, my 15 minutes of fame with the Dalai Lama. So all right, I jump, I stop the car, I jump out, I grab my purse. I'm thinking, oh, what a mess. You know, The gasoline is spilled all over the place. And as I'm getting organized, I see this little man, maybe five feet tall, running out from the gas station booth toward me. And he does not look happy. Uh, not at all. And he's going, what in the world are, ah, it's you. And he put his hands together and bowed very deeply toward me. Well, can you imagine? This guy was Tibetan. And he was reading the newspaper. And he recognized me from the photo. I, I was wearing the same jacket. Um, and and I'm like, oh, sir, sir, I am so sorry. I have made a mess of your gas station. I know you're going to have to do all the paperwork and everything, clean this up and get the insurance and blah, blah, blah. He says, no, no. I am so honored that you come to my gas station. And he bowed again. So I'm still not getting the point. I say to him, sir, I would like to pay for the damage. And I'm trying to you know, get him to agree with me. And he shook his head very, very firmly. He said, no, but may I touch you? May I touch you? And then I understood. Because, of course, Tibetans believe the Dalai Lama is the incarnation of the divine. And he knew 
that I had touched the Dalai Lama. He could see it in the picture. So he believed if he could touch me, through me, he would be able to reach the divine. Isn't that profound? I tell you, I was speechless. Imagine if you were that gas station owner, uh, attendant, and saw me, a stranger, wrecking your place of work. Because I was, right? I was an old lady causing him trouble, adding hassles. But he looked past that and he saw a deeper truth. He saw a person who had touched the divine. He saw me, not as a troublemaker, but as a blessing coming into his life, and therefore someone to be welcomed and reverenced. This is a powerful, powerful story in my life. And it reminds me how I should be towards strangers, even the ones who are causing me trouble. So even when things are going wrong, the Sufis were able to take a positive look at it. Uh, I just I love this poem. Um, one of the poets says, "God and I, we're like two giant fat people living together on a tiny boat. We keep bumping into each other and laughing." So even when you're bumping into things, or things are bumping into you, or you think your your little boat is about to tip over. Even there, there's blessings, if we have the right way of seeing. Now, I was not always aware of strangers in my life. I was not always a welcoming person, and I'm still not always that way. But God put refugees and migrants into my life to teach me those truths. And the first family, a refugee family that we cared for uh, at our Sisters of Mercy Mother House in California, was this family from the mountains of Laos, among mom and dad and five children. And, it, and the first two chapters of my book detail the story of how they came, the difficult circumstances, the sickness of the father, the reason why they had to stay with us for six weeks, um, actually the six weeks of Lent uh, in, the summer of in the spring of 1980, and how it changed my life. And this is ultimately how it changed my life. Well, we fell in love with that family, but eventually they had to go on to their sponsoring church in Indiana, and we had to say goodbye to them. This is the four oldest children in front of our mother house. And you can see how lovable they are. Well, after we put them on the airplane to go back to Indiana, or to go to Indiana, um, I had a dream, a real dream, a, a, a sleeping nighttime dream. And I dreamt that I was on a school campus I'm a teacher, so no surprise there. Um, and just as the bell was ringing, I saw on the other side of the playground these four children. And I, of course, was so excited to see them. And they came running toward me. And the, sh the little one here, Jai, who's about five years old, jumped into my arms. He gave me a big hug. And I said, Jai, what are you doing here? I, I was ecstatic to see him again in my dream. And he says, we're here to teach you a new way of loving. And then I woke up, literally, and decided that God was calling me into full-time ministry with refugees and migrants and was going to take me out of my comfort zone, out of the classroom, and into a whole new world. I've never looked back. That was 35 years ago, and it has been a source of just incredible conversion for me. There's a Kiswahili proverb that says, let the guest come so that the host may be healed. It's just the reverse of how we Americans usually think. Uh, we think when we have guests, we're doing something nice for them. But this turns it on its head, and I think there's a lot of truth in it. If we were a more hospitable culture, we might see it as the Africans see it. Now, in olden times, in desert traditions, 
there's a very strong, strong sense of hospitality. Your life literally depended on the hospitality of strangers. And um, in the Jewish faith, there's a, there's a proverb that says, Abraham's tent was open on all four sides. Now think about your house or your heart. Is it open on all four sides for the incoming of God's surprising presence in strangers. Pope Francis, uh, early last year, or sorry, in 2014, said that uh, you know God seems to prefer the periphery, the people who are last in line, lowest on our list, and and that's why it's so important to get out of our bubble, our insularity as individuals and as church uh, to experience how God is in the world. To reach out to the periphery, Francis says, to come out of our comfort zone. And I take that to mean at all different levels, not just reaching out to migrants and refugees, but surely that is included and Pope Francis has demonstrated that over and over by going to prisons, by greeting the newly arrived refugees by uh, calling us all to a year of mercy. Uh, one more quick story. Um, this is from a movie that came out maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or so. And it was a war movie, uh, but it was about Sudan so and South Sudan, so I went to see it. It takes place in the 1880s when Sudan was a colony of the British Empire. And at one point, there was a very charismatic uh, Muslim leader who led a revolt to overthrow the Brits. So the Britain uh, sent in troops, obviously, to quell this rebellion. And one of the British soldiers is separated from his regiment. He arrives much later than they do, so he has to catch up with them across the Sahara Desert. And he's woefully unprepared to, to do this. Um, so Harry, that's his name, sets out to do this. He hooks up with a caravan, and they dump him in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, you know, he's going to die. They take all his possessions and his water and all that. Except that, much like the experience of San Exupere, a Bedouin named Abu is crossing the desert and just happens to see this stranger half dead. Now, Abu is technically the enemy. He's part of the group that the uh, soldiers are there to kill. But Abu extends remarkable hospitality to Harry. He nurses him back to life, and then, of course, he follows him throughout the rest of the movie and helps him time after time to get out of trouble. Harry cannot figure out why he's doing this. And finally, he says to this guy, why do you keep saving my life? And Abu, who's a devout Muslim, looks back at him and says, well, you know, I had to, because God put you in my way. So this enemy that he stumbles across, this great inconvenience, who's, you know, changed whatever agenda he had in his mind for that day, is a blessing whom God put in his way. That is a profound understanding of welcoming, of hospitality, and of seeing the holy even in one's enemy. So we know that God's love, I'm preaching to the choir here, is a given. <clears throat> it's completely unconditional. It's always flowing toward us. It's permanent. It's extravagant. It's you know beyond our wildest imagining. And it does not depend on anything we could ever do. We cannot earn God's love, but we can't lose it either. So this is incredibly good news. However, it does have difficult consequences. Because as you can see from this snapshot from the movie, Abu, the enemy, is actually the Christ figure. And we are called to be and to act like this amazing God, which means we have to be 
welcoming of strangers and even enemies. <clears throat> we have to be about creating a world where no one is excluded. And remember, we live in a country that sits on top of the economic pyramid, that builds walls on its border to keep people out. So our faith has to inform our policies. Barbara Brown Taylor, again, in the same little book, says, you know, that God uh, shows up in whirlwinds, in starry skies, in burning bushes, and in perfect strangers. And she says further, nobody's in charge of this house, meaning this world we live in. We have no say about who's in and who's out. I'm a guest, and I'm charged with serving other guests, even those who present themselves as my enemies. I cannot act as if they are no kin to me. There is only one house. That quote deserves its own hour-long presentation, but we cannot dwell on it. I recommend her book if you have time. Uh, okay. Now my... Okay, my screen has frozen. Hold on for a minute here. Okay, I've got a frozen screen. Okay. Do you want to exit the, uh, or, or click escape and see if anything happens? Otherwise, you can just maybe continue on, or if you can recall what you're uh, planned. Wow, uh, hold on a sec here. Give me. There we go. Okay, so um, I've been using examples from the scriptures and from olden times, you know, the desert and from Hollywood, movies, but let's look at real life uh, here and now. We have some extraordinary examples of hospitality inspired by faith in our own day and age. And I just bring this example here from World War II. There was a small town in Germany, I've forgotten the name, but it was during the war, and the town was, was not Catholic, it was Lutheran. There was a pastor and his wife there who began sheltering Jews. The town was very small, and after a while, there were more Jews hiding in this town than there were German residents of the town. This obviously put the pastor and his wife at great risk, all the townspeople that were involved. And in fact, the pastor was arrested by the Nazis, imprisoned, and executed. Years later, his wife was interviewed, and the interviewer said, you know, why did you do this? Why did you put your whole town, really, at such great risk? And she said, very simply, well, we had to. It's who we are. The who being Christian. And so those of us who bear that dangerous title, Christian, are called to the same kind of behavior. It has a lot of implications. <clears throat> and there are more displaced people in our world needing welcome than have ever been displaced in all of human history. We are certainly familiar with the Syrian tragedy that's unfolding, but it's not just in Syria. There are populations all over the world displaced by disaster, by war, by prejudice, by whatever. And I worked with displaced people uh, refugee, doing refugee resettlement and uh, immigration law for over two decades. I had many chances, and, and really the book that I wrote is just a collection of stories like this. This is one of the uh, young boys from Sudan who were resettled around the year 2001 in the US. And you know, they're brought from this dusty refugee camp in Africa, 
where they lived for 12 years. And they're put on an airplane for 25 or 30 hours, and they're dropped in Silicon Valley, where my office welcomed them at the airport, gave them a transitional housing, and began preparing them for employment. So I asked one of them, Gabriel by name, uh, after a couple of weeks, I said, what amazed you the most about San Jose? And I, I was sure he was going to say the computers, the fact that he had his own bedroom, which he'd never had in his life, a real bed, uh, maybe the cars, the freeways, whatever. But he didn't blink. He said, oh, what amazed me the most? That anybody would welcome me like this. We're all thirsty for that kind of welcome. And God gives us that welcome. We must turn around and extend it to others. If for no other reason than the fact that God is the ultimate outsider. Absolutely waiting to be welcomed into our lives. And usually, as Mother Teresa says, in the distressing disguise of the poor. If you don't believe me, look at scripture. John the Evangelist says, God dwells among us as a foreigner in a tent. And you know what the, the Latin word for tent is? Tabernaculum. I often wish that instead of a small gold box in our churches, we had a tent to house that holy presence. Because God is passing by. Matthew tells us that Jesus had nowhere to lay his head. That he was rejected by his own hometown neighbors, that he was buried in somebody else's tomb. God is the outsider in our lives. He even died, quote, outside the gates of Jerusalem. He died a type of death reserved only for aliens. What does that say about our immigration policies today, about the way we welcome or fail to welcome others? D.H. Lawrence has a very long poem, and uh, part of it goes like this. What is the knocking? What is the knocking at the door in the night? It is somebody who wants to do us harm. No, no. It is the three strange angels. Admit them. Admit them. Again, this reference to Abraham welcoming the three strange angels, even if something comes to us in the dead of night, which is very scary. Are we able to welcome people? Probably not as individuals, but this is why we are church. We can do it together. And if we believe that it is God who comes to us in the guise of the stranger, then we will want to welcome strangers, both near and far. We will live this belief in all its implications at the national and local level around immigration policy. In your own town, if it is receiving refugees through Catholic charities or Lutheran services, you can become involved as a volunteer. In your own parish's openness to other cultures, to the way they want to do liturgy, to the integration and, and uh, openness that you express when they come to your place. And finally, I believe the reason we are church rather than individual believers is so that we can use the collective strength of church to do what individually might be too scary for us to do. For example, open up to housing the homeless or sponsoring refugees. So. My message to you today is to explore in your own heart, in your own faith community, how our faith should inform our approach to strangers. With that awareness that God is always flowing into our life, always bringing blessings, and that those blessings are most often experienced when we reach outside of our comfort zone and engage our faith community in welcoming strangers. Now, we'll all do this in different ways, but I believe you'll have to welcome strangers now because God has put me in your way. And I can assure you,
through my own experience that when you do this, you will, much to your surprise, find out that what Jesus said is true. I tell you these things that my own joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Now, I'm currently living out this joy and this welcoming of strangers through an organization called Mercy Beyond Borders, which I founded eight years ago and which is currently working in two countries. We work only in the most desperate of places. We work only with women and girls and we're helping them to learn, connect and lead to get out of extreme poverty. I was invited to South Sudan by Bishop, uh, a South Sudanese bishop and this is what I saw in 1992. Of course I never forgot it and so now I am there working full-time and also in Haiti. Um, and if you are at all interested in this work, please look at my website, mercybeyondborders.org. You'll find ways that you could support uh, our good work. Thank you and God bless. Sister, thank you so much. That was what a moving set of stories and presentation. I really appreciate uh, you offering your time today. Now would be the time. If you have questions for Sister, go, go ahead and ask them in the questions section. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll start the conversation off um, just a minute here. Um, but I'd love to hear any, any other questions that we can offer as well. Um, so. I, just kind of curious. So the one thing I loved about the presentation that you offered is that there weren't there weren't like specific programs as far as like here's how to set up a refugee ministry or uh, in your parish yeah. because it really does start with us, right? It really does start with our own um, ability to, to welcome the strangers. Let me pull up the here. Um, how did you go back to that transformation where that you had? You said you kind of had got pulled into that that ministry from from high school teaching and then into the this this ministry. Um, what did it take for you to kind of change the way you were acting, just like in the way that you were receiving people on a day-to-day -day basis when you were working in this ministry? Well, um, you know, I detail how it happened in the book. It just, it was by, you would think just by coincidence. I mean, I saw a note on a bulletin board uh, at our convent that said uh, refugees were arriving to the San Francisco airport and they could use the help of volunteers. So I went out of curiosity. I didn't go because I thought God was inviting me. I mean, I just thought, oh, that might be interesting. I've never met a refugee. Something new and different. Uh, so I grabbed another sister and we went over to the airport and I just began helping. And then I began organizing the high school students to help. Um, and it, it, it just, it was literally like falling down the rabbit hole, you know, from Alice in Wonderland. I mean, there was this whole world out there. I grew up so sheltered in a happy family, in a suburban house, went to a Catholic school. I didn't realize that my life wasn't the norm for the rest of the world. You know, entered the convent, taught in a classroom, controlled environment. I, I mean, I was living a good life. It was fun. It was interesting. But I had no idea of the suffering of the rest of the world. You could read about it. You could see it on the news. But it, it didn't impinge personally on me. So I would encourage our listeners here today, if you have a refugee resettlement program in your uh, community, or if you have an organized ecumenical approach to uh, welcoming the homeless, a feeding program, a shelter program, whatever, or if there's a project to, to work with the mentally ill, or any of these populations that are not yet fully integrated into our society, that are kept on the fringes, that's where God promised God was going to hang out. So involve yourself in some small way. If you can't do it personally, uh, write a check to support. Just find ways to get involved with people who are a little bit outside your comfort zone, who are a little bit strange, and you're more likely to encounter the living God and experience some, uh, what how can I say, surprising joy. I mean, I've been working with refugees for 35 years. I work in terrible places that most people don't go. They're dangerous, they're dirty, they're you know, they got giant spiders, everything horrible. And yet I'm happy. And it's because uh, God, God dwells there at the fringes. 
And so coming to church should not be the end all and be all of our faith. It should be the place that energizes us to go out to the margins as individuals or as community. Um, so if you want to read about my conversion, you really have to read the whole book. The first um, chapters are all stories, like some that I told today. And then the last two chapters are my spirituality, um, more in depth than what I shared here. Yeah, there are, I have so many questions. There's tons of questions uh, that are being asked, and I won't selfishly ask my own. And instead, I'll turn to some of those that are that have been sent in. We have some lots of positive comments that have been thanking you for your, for your presentation. Um, uh, a couple of questions are kind of surrounding the same sort of thing. Paulette's asking, in this climate of people being so afraid of migrants and refugees coming to the U.S., how can we alleviate that fear? Kim says something similar. Um, so how do you respond to people who have that fear of, of, of the very few who have hurt others? Um, mm. You know, we're always afraid. We're always afraid of what we don't know. Isn't it true? Yeah. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, when I was doing immigration work, it was very interesting to me. I would get uh, some rich people calling in and saying, can you get a visa for my maid? She's from Guatemala and we just love her. Hmm. And then these are the same people who would vote against immigrants coming to the US. You know? But it's because they knew this one immigrant, and a non-documented, uh, they love that person. Okay, so it's the same issue. We fear what we don't know, and we want to exclude ourselves. So the fear-mongering that is going on around the Western world today, around foreigners, is very uninformed and very disturbing to me. So I think the first step is see if you can make contact with someone mm -hmm. who is an immigrant. And you can do this through your Catholic Charities Office or Lutheran Immigrant World Services or Jewish Family Services that are actively receiving and working with migrants. You'll find out they aren't scary people. They're just like your own family. They want what you want, a better life for their children. I think that the fear around ISIS and uh, Al-Qaeda and all of that is a, a massive cultural uh, divide. And some of the values of our culture are not to be embraced by a person of faith. Um, and so they have developed this, what can I say, antipathy and, and hatred toward all things Western. And I wonder what would happen if we could open up dialogue with those who are currently our enemies, as Jesus did. Uh, not that that would be easy, uh, but I think that the airwaves are being controlled by uh, hate-mongering speech that is very, very deeply unchristian, and they have a right to do that, but I don't think they should call themselves Christian at the same time. Uh, it's really, really clear in the life of Jesus and in the scriptures and the stories of the saints and everything that we stand for, and as well as the example of our current pope, that we are not living our faith unless we take the risk of welcoming strangers and reaching out to them. Um, so I'm not saying this is easy, but uh, you'll find a way to do it, starting from wherever you're starting from. Good, and you certainly give us a number of examples from Scripture, uh, both Old Testament and New Testament, I think, uh, that, that would really show us that, illustrate that that truth, and, and as well as, of course, the... Uh, I think I think the stories you've offered give us clarity to the things that Pope Francis has been trying to say. You've given us some real concrete examples of what it's like to live and, and work among the people in, in the periphery. And um, uh, we have a question from Marie, who's, who's very similar, uh, but I think unique and different. She says that she's worked um, with temporary migrant workers for 15 years, and she's trouble getting them to see individuals beyond their role as workers and to welcome them in the church as fellow parishioners. Um, what are things that you suggest regarding getting people to become more welcoming and inclusive in their parish? That is such a great question, and thank you for asking it. Um, when I was doing refugee resettlement, and we had many populations arriving who were deeply Catholic, like the Lost Boys of Sudan, whatever. And we would put them into apartments and all that. And, you know, they would always ask me, where is local Catholic church? And I would give them directions and all that. They would go to church. Nobody would greet them. They would sit in the back pew where they're very black-skinned. They, you know, look different, dress different, whatever. They would go to church, sit in the back. Then the next week, somebody from one of the Pentecostal churches would come, knock on their apartment door, 
and say, oh, your neighbors told us that you're new here. How would you like to come to our church? We offer a free brunch. We would love to have you sing in our choir. Now these deeply religious people are not particularly aware of the different Catholic or Protestant groups. They just believe in God, okay, and Jesus. And so they would go to those churches. And pretty soon they're wearing a choir robe. They're doing the readings. They're feeling important again. And I say, did you ever register at your local Catholic parish? Well, no, I went once, but I didn't feel like I belonged there. So I told this story to some Catholic bishops. And I, seriously, they were like, oh, well, you know. But it's a, it's a huge problem, a huge problem. We are not, by nature, very welcoming. And the immigrants are coming from cultures that are very personable, very warm, very welcoming. And they can tell the difference. So I think the first step maybe is to start a welcoming committee uh, at your parish so that someone's always at the door. And if you see someone you've never seen before, you give them a hug and you say, Who, you know, you are so welcome here. Where, where are you from? Tell us about your life. That's all it would take. I love that. Thank you very much. I wish we're already over the hour. I, I, and there are, like, oh. sister, there are so many questions and so many words of praise coming in. I'm overwhelmed by um, the the stories you told. You're a gifted storyteller, both today, but also in the book. That it, you know, just reading through the book and the stories you pulled from, whether it's the poetry of Rumi, whether it's um, Chesterton's stories, or whether it's your own personal stories and transformation. Um, thank you for sharing your message with us today. Could, and, could and, I just say one one last thing? Please do. Yeah. Uh, uh, because I'm supporting this nonprofit now, uh, Mercy Beyond Borders, that I founded, I would love invitations to come and speak at parishes or uh, events that you are having that might result in uh, you know, a stipend for our uh, organization for the work we're doing with women and girls. So all it requires is an invitation from you. You can get my website on the, um, get my info on the website. You have to cover the cost of my transportation from California to and from wherever you want me to be and then give a stipend, a donation of some sort. But uh, I'm trying to get the word out. And if you know Oprah, hey, tell her I want to meet her. <laughs> Thank you. Or George Clooney. Sounds, <laughs> Thank you. Sounds good. See, mercybeyondborders.org, right? That's it. Thank you so okay. much for listening. Great. Thank you. Well, before anybody goes, I just want to quickly um, remind everybody, we, you know, as usual, with our uh, presenters, if we have a presenter with a, a book with, with a book that's uh, published by Ave, you can get a 20% off discount. So feel free to use this promo code, uh, Webinar126, which is today's date, and you can use that by next Tuesday, February, February 2nd, and you'll get 20% off um, and, and experience some of the many stories that the sister has shared in that, in that book and her life um, in general. Um, just real quickly, want to thank once again our partners in the, in the webinar series, the National Conference for Catechetical Leadership the National Association for Lay Ministry and the National Federation of Priest Councils. You can connect with us at many of the social media uh, sites that are out there, of course, and the recording of this webinar, as usual, will be posted on, our, on the Ave Maria Press website um, at Vimeo and then and .com as well as YouTube.com. If you go to AveMariaPress.com slash webinar hyphen videos, you can see a record of all the videos that we've, all the webinar recordings we've had over the last five, six years. Um, quickly, want to invite you over to the next webinar in our series, which will be on February 16th. Um, Katie Brajan will be talking about um, evangelization, engaging in relational evangelization, is the title of the webinar. She's the author of a new book called Room 24. She is a teacher and as well as a youth minister, and she's going to be sharing some of her um, advice as far as an experience doing evangelization as a teacher, youth minister, and, and national um, speaker. So join us again um, in February 16th. 2016. I hope you've, you've probably noticed a little bit, we have a little bit of a new logo. This is our first webinar with the new look, um, slightly different design, so just uh, hope you like that, and we've been working on that for a little while, and we're excited to have this new look for a, a new series, a new, a new uh, season here in the spring. Um, sister, again, thank you so much. I will make sure and send you the many many comments and questions so you can uh, address some of those who've uh, participated in the webinar today. So. Thank you. Thank you. God bless everybody.